Welcome, friends, here in the sanctuary at Glebe St. James and at home this morning. Today's worship service is a different take on the Stations of the Cross. Together, we will journey through Jesus' final moments as seen through the eyes of his disciple Peter. In Peter, we see a little of all of us. He's devout and resolute. He's zealous and rash, and at times even fearful and flawed. If any of us can locate ourselves in the crucifixion story, it is likely that we can see ourselves in Peter. This is a service of confession, of lament, and repentance. This is Good Friday. Through Peter's experience, we will consider our own. We will look closely at the events of Good Friday to help us honestly assess who we are. As Jesus tells Peter the truth about himself, we'll consider the truth about ourselves. If you're joining with us virtually this morning, you will need a couple of pieces of note paper and a pen to participate fully. James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Let us journey together through this difficult day, trusting in God's power and willingness to bind our wandering hearts to God's own self. Holy God, as we journey through this familiar story, help us to understand it anew. Show us, O oh God, where we find ourselves in the narrative and move us toward a more just and compassionate future. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 to 20. 
Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already decided that Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, would betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from supper, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one, another's, one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, slaves are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives the one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. We have heard these words of scripture. Now let us use our holy imaginations to read between the words and consider how Peter might have felt in these moments. This feels strange. What does Jesus mean by all of this? What does he mean by saying, not all of us are clean. He washed our feet, which was strange. But I trust my teacher. I've given up everything to follow him. Is that not love? His words seem strange. What does he know? What is he not saying? I invite you to consider Jesus' commandments to wash one another's feet. No, I don't expect you to do it literally. That bowl's a little high. But whose feet are you being called to wash? Friends, uh, you will have received when you came in uh, with your bulletin two pieces of paper and a pencil. 
I invite you on one of those pieces of paper to write the names of the people or communities that you feel God is calling you to serve. Hold on to these prayers for a later station. And we'll take a few minutes to do that. And so we move to station two. Jesus foretells Peter's denial. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 to 38. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where am I going? You cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Consider Jesus' charge. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. So write the names of people that you profoundly love on the second sheet of paper and hold on to these prayers for a later station.
Station three, Peter draws his sword. Reading from the Gospel of St. John, the 18th chapter, the first verse. Peter draws his sword. And after Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Jesus, so Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns, torches, torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing that all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. He again, again he asked them, Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these people go. This was to fulfill the word that had he had spoken, I did not loose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest slave and cut off his right ear. The priest, the slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup the Father gave me? Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.
violence in all its forms is a public health issue. Gun violence has reached epidemic proportions. We heard in the news overnight just, just today uh, of the family in Saskatchewan, gun violence. Domestic and intimate partner violence has been reported by just over twice as many women and girls as men and boys. Estimates of 41% of women and 26% of men uh, will experience some kind of family violence in their lifetime. Furthermore, violence disproportionately impacts people of color and other oppressed groups, such as the two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and um, others. And it also affects disproportionately those living below the poverty line. Communities living without adequate resources and those facing unfair treatment are more susceptible to all health issues. Exposure to violence is the greatest single predictor of future violence. Would you please join me in our unison prayer of confession? Holy One, we are distressed by our society's addiction to violence. We lament the proliferation and use of deadly weapons. We bemoan the staggering statistics of family and intimate partner violence. Yet we confess our own complicity in the pain of our neighbors. Whether we have picked up a weapon, uttered harmful words about each other, or simply refused to acknowledge another's pain, we have betrayed the peace you left with us. We have built war economies that make conflict profitable. We have created societies that justify the violence of food and housing insecurity, racism, discrimination, and marginalization. God of grace, have mercy upon us and save us from weak resignation to these evils. Amen.
Station four, Jesus is arrested and Peter denies Christ. The reading from the book of John chapter 18 continues with verses 12 to 18. So the soldiers, their officers, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. I invite you to turn your attention to the image projected on the screens, which shows a portion of the artwork created by Reverend uh, T. Denise Anderson and is inspired by Peter denying Christ. Of this piece, the artist writes, here, I try to capture Peter's initial paralysis when he's first asked if he's one of Jesus' disciples. When Jesus was arrested, Peter had only begun to see the full extent of the empire's cruelty. Would they do that to me, what they've done to him? He must have asked himself. Maybe he could be so jealous, zealous for Jesus in the past because it was all an abstraction. Now, things have gotten frighteningly real. Friends, when we think of violence, we think of calculated, deliberate, or impassioned action. In this station, we're confronted with the violence of inaction. Peter has now seen the lengths that, that power would go to silence Jesus. When asked if he was one of Jesus' disciples, Peter freezes. He must suspect that if his association to Jesus were made known, he might be met with the same violence. Please join me in prayer. Merciful God, we confess that too often we've been inactive bystanders in the face of someone else's victimization. Forgive us for choosing self-preservation over chances. Amen. Station five, P. 
Peter denies Christ again and again. The reading from the book of John, chapter 18, continues with verses 19 to 27. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Jesus was right. My Lord, what have I done? I invite you now to gaze upon the complete artwork uh, titled The Descent by Denise Anderson. This is a piece created entirely out of fabric. Anderson shares these words about the artwork as a whole. From the top, Peter descends into more fear, the kind that does not help us to be our best selves. I depict him going from stunned to defensive to belligerent, navigating the full spectrum of the fight, flight, or freeze responses to perceived threat. By the time the cock crows, as Jesus predicted, see if you can make out the bird's faint silhouette in the lower right-hand corner. Peter probably no longer recognizes himself. He must feel deflated and ashamed. He's different at the end of his descent, so I depict him differently from his three prior denials. He has much less fire in his countenance and can't even open his eyes to face what he has done. The flames recall the fire where Peter warmed himself, but they also represent purification and illumination. Peter is forced to see himself as he truly is, as Jesus had already shown him. Who will he choose to be after? When we're confronted with who we truly are, who will we choose to be after that confrontation? As we look at Peter's journey, it's my prayer that we will consider and meditate on our own. I invite you to come forward and place the papers from the initial two stations into the baptismal font. In this act, we'll symbolically participate in Peter's denial. We recognize the times when we have turned away from those we love and from those whom God has called us to serve. And we feel the pain of facing the worst part of ourselves. Choir, your bowl is up here.
station six, Jesus is crucified. This reading is from John 19, verses 1 through to 30. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to him, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I have no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I have no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered, You have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed, you, handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against Caesar. Well, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the priest, chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And they handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Well, many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But, 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 this man said, I am the king of Jews, Pilate answered. What I have written, I have written. Well, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. 
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sisters, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When you know that the world is grieving and you are partly responsible. What words of solace can you offer when you could have done something, anything, and you did nothing? What then can you do? The earth is shaken, and so am I. How do I deserve to grieve? Have I brought this on, on myself? Have I brought this on him? On us? I have not earned these tears. I do not deserve this catharsis. But what else can I do?
it is finished. And as we leave, <coughs> um, I invite you to pick up a reminder of the fact that we each have our own cross to carry. There are hot cross buns. And I invite you to take them. They're all individually bagged at the exits. Prone to wander, Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. Friends, we are more like Peter than we may like to admit. Our Lord has died, and we were not there. And so today, we grieve with Peter, and our wandering hearts are heavy. But as you leave this place, remember, your wandering heart is always tethered to the love of God. God's abundant grace existed for Peter, and it exists for each of us. God's love will never run out. So go now in peace and silence, trusting that streams of mercy shall find us all. Amen.